more children need free school meals. The call from teaching unions. They want the government to expand the scheme to anyone who is on universal credit because of the cost of living crisis. Actually, the best way to help people long term is to get people into work and make sure that those jobs are well paid. And that's the kind of thing that we're focused on doing. Also this lunchtime, holidays are off. TUI cancels six flights a day until the end of June as the airport chaos continues. Boris Johnson's former business secretary says his failures in leadership cannot be tolerated. Britain's biggest bridge, the new viaduct being built for HS2. And why Harry and Meghan are planning to keep it simple when they visit the UK for the Queen's Jubilee. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Nina Hussain. Good afternoon. Teaching unions in England are urging the government to give free school meals to more children because of the rising cost of living. They're calling for the scheme to be expanded to all families who receive universal credit. Others have gone further, saying all primary age children should get free school dinners, not just those at infant school. But in the last hour, the Chancellor said the best way to help people is focusing on getting them into well paid work. Here's our political correspondent. Libby Vina. A row about feeding the country's poorest children during the pandemic led to two government U-turns after a highly successful campaign by the footballer Marcus Rashford. Now teaching unions are hoping to repeat that, calling for a major expansion in free school meals to double the number of children who are eligible. In a letter to the Chancellor and Education Secretary, they write, we see the devastating reality of children coming to school unable to afford to buy lunch because their family circumstances mean they fall outside the restrictive free school meal eligibility criteria. Excluding so many vulnerable children is a real barrier to learning and must be urgently addressed. Union leaders say the cost of living crisis means urgent action is now needed. There are too many gaps and, and people falling through those gaps because the eligibility criteria for free school meals are too arcane, too complicated. And frankly, we need to show that we invest in our young people and do something as fundamental as make sure they are being fed properly. But the Chancellor at a factory in County Durham today didn't sound too sympathetic, arguing better paid jobs were the answer. And I think what's important to remember is actually the best way to help people long term, and this is a great example of it here at, at, at Thorn Lighting, is to get people into work and make sure that those jobs are well paid. And that's the kind of thing that we're focused on doing. Many on universal credit are of course working and teaching unions believe free school meals would be a simple way to improve their children's life chances. Libby Vina, ITV News, Westminster. Well, one man who knows from personal experience how hard it can be to feed a family is Mark Hoyle, known to millions as Lad Baby. He spent his career helping others with family finances and donated all the profits from his four Christmas number ones to the food bank charity, the Trussell Trust. He's now an ambassador for the charity with his wife. Before we speak to him, let's get a quick blast of his December hit. We're having so much fun. Mark, thank you very much for joining me this lunchtime. Look, the government obviously can't fund everything. Do you back this call today from the teaching unions that more free school meals should be a priority right now? Absolutely. Uh, you know, re reading that report, it said that I think it was 2.6 million children went without a meal or struggled to get a healthy meal in, in April. Uh, how is that happening? How is that happening in this country? And more, more needs to be done to, to help the millions of children that are going hungry. What pressure does it take off parents knowing their child will get at least one hot meal, you know, carbohydrates, vegetables, protein per day? 
I, I mean, it'll be it'll be massive. You know, parents are already having to make such difficult, impossible decisions about just heating, heating whether or not they're heating their house and their kids are going to bed cold, or whether or not they're they're having a meal a day. So, if this happens, then it, it's going to be it's going to be massive for parents. It, it has to happen. How did you deal with it when you were in that situation yourself? Look, it, thankfully now me and my wife are in a very different position, but we know what it's like struggling to put food on the table, n not knowing where your, your, your money's going to come from to make sure your, your kids are getting what they need just to get through the day. Um, it's, it's terrible. It's terrible that, that I think it's 14 million people in this country are living below the poverty line and more needs to be done. What was the worst part of that for you uh, looking back when you were in that situation? Uh, you know, my, my wife, Roxanne, she spoke quite honestly about there was a time when uh, she was doing the food shop for, for me and it was just when we had our first child and mm. she got to the till and she was about 70p short of the food shop. Um, and it's that panic. It's that panic not knowing what, what you put back. What is it that you can afford to put back to, to, to get through the, the checkout? And luckily at that time, there was, there was somebody that, that helped my wife out and gave her a, a pound in the queue and that... That, that made her cry. She was so over, overwhelmed by the generosity of somebody. And I think that's what, what we try and do now. We're trying to, trying to help people understand the problem and then, you know, make it so there isn't this many people in the country that are, that are, that are needing food banks. It's, it's, it's insane. Mark, briefly, what's your advice for any family, any mom, any dad who's experiencing this perhaps for the first time at, at the moment? Uh, don't feel embarrassed. I think that's the thing that we've uh, had a lot of, especially on social media, families contacting us saying they feel embarrassed to be in this situation. They feel embarrassed going to their food bank and don't. That's one of the things we're, we're quite passionate about, breaking that stigma around food mm. banks. And there's a lot of people that are facing this at the minute. And if you need help, it is out there. Uh, go on the website, start the Trust of Trust and mm. get the support and help that you need. Mark Hoyle, thank you very much for your advice, for joining us, and we wait to see what you come up with uh, for this Christmas. Thank you uh, very much for speaking to me today. Thank you. Thank you. Next, the holiday firm TUI has cancelled yet more flights over the next month, with unions warning the issues at airports across the country could get worse before they get better. It is a further sign of staff shortages, which began after thousands were let go during the pandemic. With the latest, here's Ellie Pitt. Queues at departures and cancelled flights. Thousands of family holidays this week have started with misery. And in the worst cases, some passengers haven't been able to go on trips they've had planned for months. You know, we were angry and disappointed and frustrated with the lack of communication, but it, it was the people that had been there or that were there that had potentially, you know, their first holiday in a number of years. And there were four wedding parties on our flight all of which, you know, will not be getting married tomorrow in Paphos as planned. The disruption and delays seen at Easter are happening again this half term. And as airline TUI announces it's cancelling some flights until the end of June, unions are warning issues will get worse this summer before they get better. The airlines desperately wanted to sell lots of tickets because they need to start paying down the billions of pounds that they owe and... Unfortunately, they haven't quite got the resources to uh, do that and neither have the airports uh, got enough staff in place. Airlines and airports across the country who laid staff off during the pandemic are now struggling to recruit as job seekers face plenty of vacancy options. We have more vacancies than we have candidates. We don't have candidates available from the uh, from the European Union where we can easily get candidates from. So it will take time to get those checks done. The government has said aviation companies should have been ready, while travel providers have apologised for the problems for passengers. But that's little consolation for those who booked a relaxing getaway and instead got a half-term from hell. Ellie Pitt, ITV News.
Some breaking news to bring you this lunchtime. The actor Kevin Spacey has said he plans to voluntarily appear before British courts to defend himself against four charges of sexual assault brought against him last week. In a statement given to the ABC News Network in the United States, Spacey says he is confident he can prove his innocence against charges brought by three men involving four separate incidents that are alleged to have happened 17 years ago. Two more Conservative MPs have openly questioned whether the Prime Minister can keep his job. First, the former Business Secretary, Dame Ledson, accused Boris Johnson of unacceptable failings of leadership, which cannot be tolerated. Then in the last hour, the MP for Carlisle has submitted a letter calling for his resignation. Our political correspondent, Carl Dinan, uh, joins me now from Westminster. How much pressure is the Prime Minister under right now? Well, he's clearly in trouble. There's a steady drumbeat ever since the Sue Gray report into the parties in Downing Street was released. Steady drumbeat of Tory MPs coming out and either criticising him or saying they want him gone directly. The most recent, as you say, is the Carlisle MP, John Stevenson. Uh, he, in the last few minutes, really has written a letter saying that uh, he is deeply disappointed about revelations concerning activities at number 10, as has Andrea Leadsom. Her opposition is quite significant. Significant. She, of course, uh, was a very prominent Brexiteer by the Prime Minister's side during that campaign. She supported his leadership. She was his business secretary. Uh, and although she comes under the heading of sacked ministers who might have a grudge, uh, it still shows that it's not just people who always opposed Boris Johnson who now want him gone. Just to remind people, uh, there will be a vote of confidence in the Prime Minister if 54 Tory MPs write letters calling for one. The last time there was one in uh, Theresa May's time. Uh, just over half of those who submitted letters went public. If half of the uh, if the 28 who criticised the Prime Minister now represents half, well he's already in trouble, will be facing a leadership contest very soon. Carl Dinan, thank you. Still to come, building bridges. Key work begins on the UK's longest railway viaduct. And why Harry and Meghan plan to keep it simple as they head to England for the Platinum Jubilee. Before that, the call for police and prosecutors to stop treating rape victims as suspects. It comes from the Information Commissioner, John Edwards, who says many are told to hand over incredibly personal details, which he called a digital strip search. Some have been asked to give up their mobile phones, others to release their medical records and or social services files. In some cases, even their school reports. Well, all this, despite the government promising to reform the way rape cases are handled almost a year ago. For reaction, we're joined by Natasha Saunders, who is a rape survivor turned campaigner. She's waived her right to anonymity to help other victims. Her ex-partner is serving a prison sentence for rape. During the investigation, Natasha's phone was taken by police and never returned to her. Natasha, welcome. Was it ever explain to you why they needed to see what was on your phone? No, and I think one of the main issues is that, you know, as, a, as an abuse victim, you are, are very easy to manipulate. You don't ask questions. And so you say yes. They ask if they can have your phone, you say yes. They ask if they can see your medical records, you say yes. They're the police. Despite the fact that it's violating, you don't think to question it at the time. OK, and then later, you might question it. It's being questioned. It has been questioned. What impact did that have on you, especially given what you'd endured and why you were with the police in the first place? I think one of the really scary things was that I was never told that the defence would use things on my mobile phone against me. I was presented with 39 pages of WhatsApp messages in court and asked what certain things meant by the defence. And it was it was a real shock to me. I understood that evidence needed to be disclosed, but I felt like I was guilty until proven innocent. I felt like I was under investigation for being the victim of a crime. 
Natasha, the government had said it was looking into this. The Information Commissioner, who is the independent authority making sure our data is protected, is calling for this to happen right now. From your point of view, if there is somebody who has been raped, who has to go through what you went through, what difference would this change make that they didn't have to talk about their school reports or messages they may have sent to other people in a court of law? I'm always cautious about how I portray the trial and the investigation because I never want to put a victim off coming forward. Mm. To really reform, what we need to do is have lived experience, survivor voices involved in this reform. So the people who are forming the guidelines aren't assuming what's best for people like me. And I don't think any victim should feel any more violated than they already have. You know, the head of Hampshire Police once said that to survive rape is to survive the most serious crime that anybody can actually survive. So second only to murder. We shouldn't feel any more humiliated or on display than we already have been made to feel by our perpetrators. Mm. Natasha Saunders, thank you very much uh, for your thoughts and for joining us thank on you. this important matter. Thank you. Average petrol prices rose by nearly three pence per litre over the past week to reach yet another record high. The average price of a litre of petrol at UK Four Courts was a record 170.4 pence on Monday. Diesel prices were also up by just under a penny per litre to 182.4 pence. Only one police force in the UK is meeting a key target to answer 999 calls in under 10 seconds. The Home Office wants 90% of calls to be picked up in under 10 seconds, but currently Avon and Somerset Police are the only force to meet that standard. And the fast fashion firm Misguided has fallen into administration. The company employs just over 300 staff at its base in Manchester. An international bridge-building machine has started work on the UK's longest railway viaduct. Nicknamed Dominique, the 700-tonne machine has been shipped in from Hong Kong to help construct the 3.4-kilometre Cone Valley viaduct on the outskirts of London for the new HS2 train line. Martin Stew watched as Dominique began her mammoth task. HS2 has been controversial because of the cost, the route and the potential environmental impact. But one thing no one's denying is the scale of the engineering project. And today we've got a glimpse of that, uh, starting with what's called the launch girder. This giant red structure behind me, it stretches 155 metres. It's really a large crane, a giant bridge builder, if you will. And what it's doing uh, is moving a thousand of these huge concrete segments, each weighing up to 140 tonnes into place and slotting them together to create a uh, nearly two mile viaduct in the Colm Valley. And one of the engineers who's helped with that is Tom O'Connell. Tom, uh, just talk us through how big this project is. We don't see much of this sort of thing in the UK, do we? No, we really don't. It truly is the way we're uh, constructing this viaduct is really unique to this country. Because we can hear them turning it on. I think they're going to lower one of these quite soon. And you have to put it on balanced out, otherwise the whole thing could tip over because it's yeah. so heavy. Yeah, that's it. That's correct. So we put st steel wires through all the holes within the segment, pull them in tension, and that... that, that, that Fits it together like a giant it. jigsaw. Now, it's going to take about two years in total. When the whole route is finished, this will be almost the first thing you see as you're coming out of London, you come out of the tunnels and over this viaduct. How proud are you to be a part of that? Yeah, I mean, to leave behind a truly landmark structure, yeah, really, really does feel special to be part of it. Brilliant. Tom, thank you very much indeed. They've got a long way to go. They're just putting the first couple of segments in, as I say, a thousand to piece together, and it should take about two years. Goodness. Martin Stew reporting there. Finally, Harry and Meghan are coming to the UK with their two children for the first time as a family since they quit as working royals. They're coming to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. And now we've learned they promise not to overshadow the celebration and to keep it simple. Our royal editor, Chris Ship is at Buckingham Palace. Chris, what does that mean? Well, Nina, I mean, Harry and Meghan are due in the UK in the next day or so for the Queen's Jubilee celebrations. And I know there have been a lot of concerns in royal circles about what that will do. You know, will it generate a media circus? Will they go off and do their own 
um, engagements. Crucially, will they overshadow the Queen's uh, Platinum Jubilee? Well, um, as I understand it, that's not going to happen. Uh, someone with knowledge of their travel plans told me that they will keep it simple. Uh, they will essentially stick to the script. And that's important because, of course, Harry and Meghan haven't actually done a public engagement here in the UK uh, since they left the royal family, since, of course, Meghan did that explosive interview uh, with Oprah Winfrey. So I think if that were to happen, if that were to transpire, I think there would be a lot of um, a lot of relief uh, in royal circles and among royal aides. And as you can probably see behind me, uh, some of those rehearsals for those events are going on right now. Yeah, tell us more about the rehearsals for uh, especially the Jubilee pageant that's taking place where you are. Yeah, the Jubilee pageant happens on the uh, Sunday. Now, this pageant is pretty long. It's like the conclusion of the four-day uh, event, and there will be, I am told, and I've got someone who can tell you more about it, lots of dancing. Uh, Stacey McKnight, uh, you are leading one of the dance troops, is that right? Yes, we are. Steph is involved in a lovely uh, parade this weekend. Now, you call them your babies, don't you, the, the ones you, I you do. teach? Let's have a look. We're going to have a look at them uh, sort of uh, rehearsing and dancing at the moment. But basically, tell us, you're on a on a lorry, a truck, yeah. and you're dancing. We're dancing, there's gonna be some young people on the, the truck and also um, dancing per side um, as, it, as it's moving. Now, you are no novice because actually you did this 20 years ago when the Queen had her golden, golden jubilee. jubilee. Is that right? I Tell me about that. I was involved in that, um, signing down the mall uh, and dancing also. So it's lovely to be able to have my company now be part of this event. So now you're coming back as the kind of teacher. Uh, yeah. I mean, the whole thing's going to be quite spectacular. I mean, we, so we've seen images of BMX bikes bouncing around on the back of these lorries. It's, it's really long as well, isn't it? It's Three very, kilometers? very long. Yes, very long. And um, yeah, there's loads going on. Like you said, the BMX riders, uh, uh, unicycles, um, trampolinists, it's going to be crazy. So how are you feeling about it? I mean, you can you can see right now it's raining. Um, yeah. No one can see that. We've got a roof <laughs> over us. But actually, on Sunday, you're hoping clear weather, big crowds and a massive celebration. Yeah? Oh, yes, definitely. We need that sun um, and that big celebration. Yes. Are you excited? I'm very and you, excited. And you, your babies will be excited. My babies are so yeah. excited. They cannot wait. And it's, it's going to be a big opportunity for them. So I'm really, really happy to be okay. here. Okay. All right. Well, I'm not going to step uh, beyond the little uh, cover that I've got here because of the rain. Uh, but uh, you will be able to see that pageant on Sunday. But before that, we've got Trooping the Colour on uh, Thursday. We've got a service at St Paul's on Friday. And then the Epsom Derby on Saturday. So a lot going on, Nina. Yep, indeed. Chris, thank you very much. I love the fact she just didn't stop smiling throughout that interview. Mary will be here at 6.30 with the latest from me. Bye-bye.